Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Happy Hour Weekly. I am your host, Chris Wright. Um, today, we are going to be talking politics. Now, if you love politics and this is your jam, you will you should enjoy this. This is, you know, for everyone who loves politics, the politicos, the talking heads, and things like that. But I'm really going to uh, connect it to why it's so important in my industry, which is the real estate industry. But it will also be applicable in other industries as well. So um, if that's your thing and you want to figure out why this is important, that's great. If you're not into politics, uh, listen anyway, because I'm going to talk about some very important things that may resonate with you and your profession and your industry. But um, stick with us. We will be right back after this. See you on the other side. This is the Real Estate Happy Hour, and I'm your host, Chris Wright. It's a fun place where we talk real estate, pop culture, and what's trending. Hey, I might even give you some good advice. So grab yourself a drink, sit back, relax, and take a listen. Unless you're driving, of course. I'll see you guys on the other side. All right, so... Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be um, a tough podcast for me. I don't like to talk politics anymore. I was, at one point, I was really entrenched in it um, back in 2015 and during the Obama administration. <clears throat> but I, I think I've lost some people in that process. Um, it created some divisions. It was a really tough time for me personally because I do not like. Uh, creating divisions. I like bringing people together. I like connecting. So politics, although I love it, it was just something that didn't fit into my life. Uh, and I'm doing a lot better with that now. But today I'm going to talk politics a little bit differently. I want to talk about how it affects us. I see people that are getting disengaged from politics. They're getting angry. They're, um, they're, they just want nothing to do with it. People have stopped watching mainstream media or the news. Um, there, I look at TikToks and other YouTubers and there's so much division about race and politics and just social, the social aspect of our lives. And I want to make sure that we still stay engaged in politics, no matter how ugly it gets, no matter how hard it gets and why, why it's important. So we're going to be very vulnerable today and we're going to talk about some of the challenges I've had with politics over the last five years or more. Um, but why are politics important? Uh, why is getting involved in the voting process important, even though it can be ugly and tenuous and, and difficult for us? So one is represent, representation. Um, voting allows people to choose representatives, you know, who make decisions on their behalf. There's also policy influence, you know, voting shapes national and local policies and it impacts like stuff like health care education and infrastructure. Um, there's also community impact. We're always talking about community, uh, local elections, making sure you're being involved in that. They directly affect neighborhoods and influence like services and regulations. Uh, civic engagement is very important. Um, voting, like it fosters a civic responsibility and a community connection. Some people volunteer at the polls or they like to make sure that they're engaged in the process somehow, some way. Then there's the accountability that we have. We have, have to be account accountable. We have to hold our elected officials accountable and ensure a balanced democracy, if you still believe in that. And then there's the whole social justice thing where um, voting supports social justice and equality through policy advocacy. So we wanna make sure that if you consider yourself um, a social social justice warrior, so to speak, that can be considered a derogatory term. But if you consider yourself one who advocates for social justice, how can you do that without being involved in the, the, the political process or the voting process? But there's also educational opportunities. Um, discussing politics educates listeners, you know, on the electoral process and policy impact. You know, my voting habits won't surprise you. I've ever since I could vote, I voted Democrat. And I considered myself a liberal because we always attach 
the term liberal to Democrat and vice versa. And we can we attach the term conservative to Republican. But if you really, really are honest with yourself and you're true to yourself, you can be conservative and be a Democrat. You can be liberal and be a Republican. It's a very, they're very interchangeable terms, but we get pigeonholed into certain columns and certain blocks that tell us you're Democrat, so you must be liberal. And you might be Democrat because that was your family's uh, party, or that's what you grew up learning about in your community, in your demographic, in your neighborhood. But l- let's let's parse the terms a little bit. Let's let's go through them um, the way I understand them. Okay, and I would love comments and feedback if if I'm wrong in any way. You know, people who vote Democrat for they vote Democrat for reasons such as. They're they're known to have uh, progressive values, all right? Um, Alignment with social justice, equality, and inclusivity. They also um, are healthcare advocates, you know, support for reform, you know, to increase and access affordability. There's environmental stewardship, emphasis on addressing climate change and environmental issues. Then there's social programs that uh, have government influence and that government pays for with, with taxpayer dollars. Um, Democrats a lot of times support robust social safety nets and programs. And then there's education policies, um, advocacy for increased funding and improved access to education. And of course, there's diversity and inclusion. Um, There's a big emphasis on policies promoting diversity and fighting discrimination. And workers' rights, support for fair wages, labor protections, um, and workers' rights. And of course, there's foreign policy, different approaches emphasizing diplomacy and cooperation. And of course, there's those, there's the social issues um, where there's progressive stances on LGBTQ plus rights, women's rights, and criminal justice reform. And of course, there's government intervention, um, advocacy for government intervention, uh, intervention, uh, to address inequality and promote economic justice. And all these factors can contribute to individuals choosing to vote Democratic candidates, all right? Um, And me personally, I've considered myself a Democrat all my life, as I said earlier, but I live really more of a conservative life. I think like a Republican sometimes, and I have for a long time. But I just never attached myself to that, basically because of some of the more bombastic or more robust verbiage from a lot of Republicans you might see in the news. But you got to remember how many men and women are in the Senate, how many women, men and women are in Congress. Out of all the people that serve in Washington, D.C., you only hear the voices of a few of them. You don't hear the voices of the majority of them, and a lot of them some being Democrats, they may have a lot of conservative or Republican values, but they just ran under the Democratic Party and then vice versa. There are Republicans who are a little liberal. There are Republicans who think like Democrats and some Republicans or more right-wing people will call them rhinos. But why do people vote Republican? As I, I'm going to go over uh, a couple of those terms. Here's a, here's some of the rep- Republican values. They have conservative values, alignment with limited government, you know, personal freedom, and traditional family values. I want to stop right there because I don't like the term. I used to love, I do like the term family values. I don't like it that it was hijacked by the Republican Party. That if you are a Democrat or if you're considered liberal, then you lack family values. But if you're a Republican, then you believe in family values. I think people on both sides of the aisle believe in family values. I'll go on. I digress a little bit. Republicans, they have economic policy, support for free market principles, uh, lower taxes, and reduced government regulations. Their their thoughts on national security, they have an emphasis on a strong stance on national, national security and a robust military. They believe in Second Amendment rights, support for Second Amendment rights, and opposition to strict gun controls. Um, There's also 
a pro-life stance, opposition to abortion, and a support for pro-life policies. Immigration policies, advocacy for stricter immigration policies, border security, and law enforcement. State rights, uh, emphasis on state rights and federalism. Then they have uh, tax policies, support for lower taxes for individuals and businesses. And then there's the conservative judicial appointments. They have a priority on appointing conservative judges. Did you notice that when I talked about the Democrats, I had mentioned nothing about Supreme Court judges? Well, Democrats, you really have to think about that more because every time we lose a big case like Roe v. Wade or something that they, the, the, the Republicans, uh, Republicans consider overturning, it's because we, as a Democratic Party, or I should say the Democratic Party, didn't put an emphasis on conservative or liberal judicial appointments. So we have to make sure that both sides are involved in that process in selecting Supreme Court justices. And Republicans also believe in limited government. I think I mentioned that earlier, you know, advocacy for limited government involvement in individual lives. So as I went through both of those, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, I have beliefs on both sides. I believe a lot of the things that the Democrats believe. I believe a lot of the things that the Republicans believe. Um, and these factors, they contribute to individuals choosing to vote for Republican candidates or Democratic candidates. Now, how I think, um, I have a two thought process and I have theories um, because you don't have to follow one. You can be on both sides. Now, conservatives, uh, they emphasize tradition, stability, limited government. They don't like a lot of change. They don't like a lot of progression. Then there's uh, the favor for free market principles and lower taxes, as we talked about. They hold traditional views on social issues. The problem I have with that is that as our thinking changes, as people present us with new ideas, and we can, it's okay to go, hmm, I've never thought of it like that. Some of us, particularly baby, baby boomers and Gen Xers, a lot of us grew up with parents who had very limited ideas, very closed-minded ideas about race, sexual orientation, and family. And as they raised children through the 70s and 80s and 90s, sometimes we had to tell our parents, mom, I really, really, really want you to think about how you think, what you're saying that mixed race marriages are okay now, or um, love is love, LGBTQ, they're not going away. People are people. Sometimes we had to teach our parents that holding on to these traditional values or social issues isn't always the way. Um, conservatives prefer a limited government role in individuals' lives. That's me. I want the government out of my life I don't want the town in my life. I don't want the village in my life, the state, the city. As much as we can get them out of our lives, I do believe in limited government. Have I ever applied for social services? I have 100% transparent. I'm not going to try to sit here and say that I don't believe in you know programs that help people that are in need. But I just don't want them regulating or having a say in everything I do down to even what type of car I buy or what type of appliances I buy or the size of my in-law suite or anything that has, has to do with my home or family. I want them to stay out of that. You know, and then there's the liberal principles who may advocate, advocate for progress, social justice, as we talked about, government intervention. They support regulations, progressive taxation, and social reforms, which I don't want any of that, okay? Um, I don't want the government getting involved in social reforms. I believe that we as the people should be able to do that. As individuals, as communities, as neighbors, I don't need the government telling me where I can live or what I should support or what my workplace has to support, all right? Um, liberals tend to be socially progressive, as we talked about, emphasizing equality. We've, we've taken equality so far that I don't even recognize, rec recognize it anymore, what equality looks like. There's equity and equality, and I don't think many of us know the difference, but that's for another podcast. 
And then um, it says liberals may prioritize, you know, a more active government role, you know, in addressing inequalities. Once again, there's so much government and hands-on intervention, and we want the government to tell us uh, how to handle handle, um, inequalities. And we've taken it way too far in the workplace, in our communities, um, and, and in politics. And many of us, we've been duped into believing that we're supposed to be one way or the other because of skin color or ethnicity, of economic status, and most oftentimes because of demographic. Joe Biden even said, if you vote for Donald Trump, you ain't, you ain't black. And that's offensive to me. If you vote for a Republican, you ain't black. So what does that say about all of our black Republicans? What does that say about our black conservatives? Does that mean automatically out the gate they must be Uncle Toms or excuse the language coons or they they're they're you know house Negroes just because they're black and they believe differently because they're conservative, they might not be in line with some of the same thoughts and values that a liberal may have. I don't like it. So um back in 2015. I really, really, really hated Donald Trump. I'm not, I'm not going to lie, right? But I had shallow reasons for that. One, because he wasn't Obama. I had a love fest with uh, Barack Obama. Two, because he beat Hillary. Very shallow, right? Three, because I was too dialed in into mainstream media. And I, I primarily listened to one side, the MSNBC, um, Daily Beast, CNN, and all of the liberal news outlets. And I didn't digest enough conservative politics. You know, the um, Glenn Beck's, Fox News, you know, all of those, there's different sides. And I really think that you should have a balanced diet of both. You may cringe from some of it, but the more I started listening to conservatives and right-wing people on social media and in the news, the more I was able to adjust my thinking. I didn't say I was going to jump ship from the Democratic Party, so to speak, or from liberal values, but it allowed me to see the other side. And the other thing, other reason I hated Donald Trump back then was because at the time, I thought that truth had to have a face or a certain look and a behavior. And for all you out there who says, well, Donald Trump's not truth, there are some things that he said as bombastic as it may have sounded, had truth in it. We might not have liked the delivery, but there was truth in a lot of the things that he was saying. Because you ever have a a parent, an old uncle, <laughs> I call it an old uncle, who has an opinion about a group of people or a certain social issue or a certain group. And... um They say it and you cringe because you go, dad, you can't say that. That was Donald Trump. He was old uncle. And you said, Donald Trump, you can't talk like that. This is a new day. This is new times. We think differently. But there was some truth in it. Like when he would say um, the the media or mainstream media is the enemy of the people or the, the press lies. That sounds horrible because we've always depended on the press. We've always depended on the media to be informed. But then as we became more entrenched in social media and people speaking their mind and being open and transparent and vulnerable, we realized that maybe we don't have the whole story. Maybe um, uh, stories and headlines are, you know, fabricated or crafted in a certain way to make us think a certain way. Maybe Facebook was, you know, selling um, information to groups and organizations that was uh, fixing our algorithms to make us behave and react a certain way. So over the last few years, as I've become more mature in politics, I started voting for best, with, with my best interests, not anyone outside me. I started thinking and getting educated about my best interests, Um, job, my job, my career, the best opportunity to progress progress in my business. And that's the way we all should do it. 
who are we voting for and where do we stand politically? Are we looking out for our best interests? Are we voting for things that's going to raise our taxes that's going to affect our families personally? Are we voting and advocating for things that's going to affect our workplace? Are we voting for regulations that's going to affect how we live day to day, where we can go, what we can do, what freedoms do we have to do it? And that's how I'm voting now. So just a few months ago, I decided to change my political party to, to independent. My political party is really no one's business. And by me saying independent, um, I'm not, that doesn't make me better than Democrats or Republicans. It just said that in my mind, it gives me a clear conscience that I am not a member of a certain party, if that makes sense. That's for me. It's not for the outside world. And then I talked to some people. I just spoke to a gentleman yesterday. He said, I vote libertarian. Do I know what a libertarian is? No, but that's for him. He feels that he should be a libertarian for him because he's not attached to the two-party system and it's a way he thinks and what his values are. So back in 2019, um, I was at the National Association of Realtors Conference in Washington, D.C. And whenever the national, we call it NAR, N-A-R, but whenever the association is in Washington, whoever the sitting president is, we ask them to come and be our keynote speaker. And during the year that I went, Donald Trump was the keynote speaker. At that, my, at that time, in my political immaturity, I disliked him so much, I set it out. While he was in the... Um, Excuse me. While he was in the main conference hall speaking, um, I only heard echoes of him coming out, but there was a bar very nearby the auditorium. And there was quite a few liberals in there and far left people said, ah, I'm not listening to that crap. I'm going to go have a drink, have some coffee, whatever. So I did not go to the speech. I set it out. I wish I hadn't it today. Um, so, but a few years later, after I got Donald Trump out of my system, I, um, I decided to search for that speech on YouTube. And regrettably, I found, I found that the speech was fun and it was engaging. But more importantly, it was extremely supportive of my industry, the real estate industry. And that's where my focus should have been, not on my hatred for who he was, but I should have been more dialed in and willing to hear what he had to say. Um, because... It's really important that the guy who's going to be president or the guy who's going to be governor or mayor, and they have so much control and impact in my industry, and they actually think about, you know, making my job easier and more prosperous, I need to lend an ear to that person, man or woman. So while watching the video, I thought, I've never seen or heard a politician talk in such a positive way about realtors and our industry. <laughs> he spoke like a realtor, but I had shrunk. I felt horrible because I missed it live. I had the opportunity to see a sitting president in my presence, 50 to 100 feet away, which would have been the closest I've ever been to a president. And in my hatred and immaturity, I missed it. I just want you to take a um, a look at this uh, clip. This is just, just it, it's funny, a couple minutes long, but this is what I missed. Look at the unemployment numbers, the best since 1969. And, and in a very short period, it'll be, assuming we just go a little bit further, it'll be the best in history. The unemployment numbers are great, but the employment numbers are even better. We have the most people working today than at any time in the history of our country. We have almost 160 million people working. And many of those people are going to go out and buy a house, right, Tracy? They're going to use you as the broker. They're going to call, Tracy, I want to buy a house. And I won't pay you 6%, Tracy, I won't. I'll pay you 1%. I was famous for that. No, no. 
Don't worry, nobody accepted it, don't feel. But I tried like hell, I'll tell you. No, but I'd get it down to four or five, that's not so bad. I had one case in Palm Beach, believe it, a hundred million dollar house, can you believe it? And the broker did a fantastic job, and I told the broker, I'm paying you more than you're supposed to get. You got millions. Sold the house for a hundred million dollars, you believe it? Bought it for 39, then I sold it for a hundred. It wasn't immediate, it took a couple of years, that's okay. I had to paint it inside a little bit, a little paint. A little fix up, a little fix up. I call it a turnaround. Because I had nothing, to, you know, I had a beautiful house, Mar-a-Lago, and I said that was, this was one that came onto the market through a, really a tragedy, a very sad situation with the, the owner had a tremendous problem. And so anyway, it was put up and I got it and I sold it, I flipped it, but I had a great broker, two good brokers actually, but I paid them more money than they uh, actually asked for. I made a deal with them and I paid them more. And I've done that a lot. I've also done it the other way where I'm not so happy. Then I do a little, but I won't talk about that today. We'll save that for another time. But really, there's nothing like a good broker. I mean, you're no different than a great surgeon, a great anything. I mean, it's true. It's true. And you're not all brokers. You're realtors, and you build, and you rent, and you lease, but you sell. And uh, honestly, I, I've, seen, I've seen cases where you give it to the wrong person, and you just sit, and you just die with it. And then the right person comes along, and it's like genius. It's like genius. And you have to remember those people. Those are great people. And you have to reward them properly. I really mean it. You have to reward them properly. So you are really, truly, fantastically talented people. There are some probably in this room that don't have such great talent. You know who I am and you know who they are. But, uh, but you have some tremendously talented people in this room. I know this business so well. I love this business. And uh, you have people that can really do a job that very few people can do. And frankly, if you went into another business, you'd do great with that too. But there's something about the real estate world that's, uh, it's incredible. You just love it. It's in your blood. It's in your blood. So even as president, and that's why I tell you, even as president, I ride down those streets and I say, wow, is that place nice? Wow, what could you do with that? Look at that site. And then I said, wait a minute, I have to deal with China. Forget about this stuff. So, yeah, I missed that. And he, uh, he spoke for an hour and, um, I watched the whole video and it was, it was like, again, it was very engaging. It was funny. Uh, we, there were other speakers that he introduced on the stage and um, who said some pretty wonderful things about the real estate industry, how we were changing, um, how we were, were progressing, some of the challenge that were, challenges that we were going to face. And um, it, was, it was a really enjoyable video. You should be voting as an independent thinker for a cause that affects you and your community and your neighbors, and not necessarily for the collective masses. My concerns are often not the concerns of those people living in Arizona or Montana or Seattle or Los Angeles. I live in a small town in upstate New York, and our concerns are a lot different than voters, you know, in Manhattan and Queens even, or Westchester. So this brings me to a podcast um, I recently listened to by my friend, and colleague Lee Brown. And I'm gonna share some of the excerpts with you from her podcast that resonated with me. Um, she was talking a lot about the National Association of Realtors, but she was also talking about we as Americans and how we should view our profession, our industry, getting involved in politics, the process. Um, and before I do that, I wanna introduce you uh, to Lee, not live, but just talk about her a little bit and why I've been so impressed with her over my time in, in real estate. Because I, th I think uh, she would do the same for me. You know, Lee's a lifelong resident of North Carolina. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree from UNC Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels, my favorite basketball team in college. Uh, to today, Lee lives in Harrisburg, North Carolina, husband, two wonderful kids. She's a professional speaker. She's a podcaster, YouTuber. She's a best-selling author. And most importantly, she's a realtor, and she's also a CEO. And um, in her free time, you, you can find Lee spending time with her family or running marathons. Uh, she's a true public servant who um, is dedicated to serving her community and her country. And she's running for Congress, I think the 8th District in North Carolina. And Lee will defend our country from what she calls the radical left. And she'll build upon the America, America First um, agenda. If you want to find her, you can go to LeeBrownForCongress.com 
or LeeBrown.com as well. And she also has LeeBrownUniversity.com. And her, her brokerage is the one community dot real estate. She has a podcast called Crazy Shit in Real Estate. And um, the episode we're going to be taking clips from is episode four, 438, Leadership SOS. It's an emergency. Revitalizing the real estate leadership. And we're going to listen to a few clips. So in this first clip, um, it highlights Lee's perspective on the significance of real estate in the country's gross domestic product. And she suggests that by positively influencing the real estate sector, the entire country can be steered in the right direction economically. And emphasis on the belief that real estate plays a crucial role in driving overall economic growth and development. Take a listen. Because real estate is the fifth biggest piece of GDP. If we start pulling real estate in the right direction again, I think the country's going to pull in the right direction again. So, yeah. Did you hear that? I'm going to play it once more because it was kind of low. Take, take a listen. Because real estate is the fifth biggest piece of GDP. If we start pulling real estate in the right direction again, I think the country's going to pull in the right direction again. I 100% agree with that because, you know, is the fifth, she, she, told, she taught us that it's the fifth largest GDP in the country. And our economy seems to ebb and flow based on the real estate market and whether people are, are buying and selling houses. So I thought that was a very, very key point. Um, in this next clip, Lee encourages readers, you know, to approach news about crisis, you know, and leadership in the national news media with optimism. We hear so much bad stuff that we immediately, immediately think, you know, doom and gloom. And specifically in the context of real estate, she's talking, she suggests that like, you know, by choosing to be optimistic about the potential of the organization, we're talking about the National Association of Realtors, emphasizing how, you know, how it has looked in the past and what it can achieve in the future with full support. Uh, she also emphasizes the importance of embracing disagreement as a key factor in the organization's growth and success. Take a listen. So that's what I'm going to ask you to do when you read about these crises in leadership in the national news media, that you choose to be an optimist about real estate, that you choose to be an optimist about what the organization can look like, has looked like, and can do in the future if it is fully supported and if it learns how to embrace disagreement. Yeah, so disagreement is okay because disagreement fosters new ideas. It, it fosters new direction. It teaches us how to play in the sandbox together. So that's really huge, and she advocates for that. All right, this next clip is about patriotism a little bit. It reflects um, a sentiment about the significance of national unity and patriotism in the context of the United States of America. You know, Lee emphasizes the importance of, like, believing in the country and valuing symbols such as the American flag. It's such a small symbol, but it's huge. This is, that's what bonds us is the American flag. Like no matter when, when wars break out, when 9-11 happened, we always come together under that flag, you know, and the suggestion is that by rekindling a shared sense of being Americans um, and embracing patriotism, she believes that it might be possible to address and resolve various crises that have faced the nation. And if you believe in this country, that you start to say the American flag matters and that patriotism matters and that maybe the through line that we always had, that we were Americans together, maybe if that comes back, we can solve all the crises in this country. I, can you disagree with that? I, I love it. I love it. There was, I mean, I was listening to this podcast. I was like, preach, girl, preach. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, this next clip, Lee encourages independent research and critical thinking, um, suggesting a shift away from merely relying on headlines, because uh, that's kind of what triggers us. Uh, she emphasizes the importance of personal investigation and once informed, um, taking action to propose and implement solutions. Uh, this message, message kind of underscores the historical strength of America in identifying issues, acknowledging shortcomings, and innovating uh, to create, you know, improved solutions. The central theme revolves around the idea that um, the essence of America's strength lies in its ability to address problems constructively and continuously strive for betterment. Take a listen. 
maybe just maybe we stop listening to headlines and we do a little digging on our own. And then when we do our digging, we learn how to bring solutions forward because nothing matters if we stop bringing solutions forward. That's where America's always had our strength. We saw that things weren't working and we make better versions of it always. Right. So, wow, that's, that's just, that's just huge. So we have to make sure that we're just not um, getting those triggered headlines as we're scrolling through social media, reading newspapers or looking at the bottom of this TV screen and we go, what? And we get all incensed and crazy about it. And there was newspapers like the Daily Beast who used to do that. They, they found the most triggering headlines for people to follow and it just angered some of us. So dig deep and try and find out, okay, so I just read that or I just watched this. Let me find out what's going on on the other side. Um, in this next clip, I'm gonna play uh, Lee delves into the world of real estate in the year 2024, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Whereas seasoned real estate professionals, we have to challenge you to witness the impact of our services through the voice of satisfied customers and clients. Um, she encourages a focus on the tangible results and experiences that highlight the values we bring, you know, to those seeking their expertise in the real estate market. Um, so that's going to be really, really huge. So in 2024, I want you to decide something. If you believe in real estate, I need you to start talking about what you do for your clients and let your clients speak up about what you have done for them. Right. So it's really important as we protect our industry, as we protect our livelihood, we have to be more vocal. We have to take better actions to show the public that we are valuable in this industry, what we mean to the GDP, what we mean to the real estate industry as a whole. Uh, this next excerpt I found interesting is uh, Lee emphasizes the importance of the importance of uh, individuals having a position or stance, you know, particularly in the context of uh, this upcoming election, um, the message is directed at all of us. It urges us to uh, recognize that whether or not we consciously, consciously uh, choose a position, that we inherently hold one. So listen as she like advocates for the, an empowerment and proactive approach to participating in the political landscape. I want you to understand that you have a position for a reason. And if you're watching this and you don't have a position, guess what you do? You have a position. If you live in the 8th District and you're a voter and you're tired of seeing the same thing over and over, maybe you need to say, I want to help elect Lee Brown. Maybe you are a voter somewhere in a different state and you'd like to see something different. Go interview your candidates and find somebody you can stand behind. Right. So, yeah, you do have a position. You do have some some skin in the game. You have to hold elected officials accountable and you have to hold yourself accountable by being present, by being vocal. Uh, so let's make sure that we, we follow that, that wisdom. Um, so in this next clip, it talks about Lee expresses frustration with the division in the country, which is as I do too, um, particularly highlighting the, you know, the issue of some people associating the American flag exclusively with, with one group. I once heard, uh, I saw a social, a social media reel or it was a TikTok or something where a girl said, every time I see the American flag, I think about racist Republicans. Every time I see the American flag on the back of a truck or a flag waving on the back of a boat or in, on someone's lawn, I immediately think they're Republican or they're conservative or they're racist. Um, every time I hear someone who advocates for that thought process, waving the American flag, they're saying, I'm American and you're not. So, you know, she calls for unity, urging everyone to find a common ground, uh, drawing a parallel to, you know, the real estate industry. Again, uh, Lee emphasizes this shared commitment, shared commitment um, to serving the public and supporting the American dream of home ownership. It's still a dream. You know, she advocates for speaking out against, you know, influential entities like hedge funds and institutional investors. Uh, take a listen. Because of all the things that have irritated me about the division in this country, I absolutely hate that there are some who believe the American flag only belongs to one group and the other group doesn't like it. Get over that and let's decide that we have something in common. In real estate, the something we have in common is that servant's heart where we serve the public. 
We support the American dream. We bring home ownership forward. We speak against hedge funds and institutional investors, and we should learn to speak against ESG and BlackRock because that shouldn't be determining what we do every day as practitioners. Right. So if you don't even know what that is and you're remotely interested in real estate, if you don't understand these hedge funds and these major investors who are buying up middle class homes, you really, really need to understand why that happens, how that happens, and how legislation can fix the way that happens. All right. So that was a really, really, really important uh, piece of wisdom as well. All right, the next one, this next clip, got a few more. Lee reflects on, um, you know, the idea of spring cleaning. That's a nice way of saying drain the swamp. It's a nice way of saying let's let's understand the whys, okay? But we need to reflect on the spring cleaning on various levels, you know, emphasizing uh, the importance of understanding the purpose and purpose and significance of one's role, you know, particularly in the field of real estate. Um, she encourages practitioners in the real estate industry, you know, to take ownership of their responsibilities. So she's suggesting that you know the improvement of the industry hinges on individual commitment and understanding. Um, the mention of real estate's prominence and existence of a dedicated network on TV highlights like HGTV and Bravo um, is significant. So Lee encourages a thoughtful reflection on personal motivations and a sense of responsibility within the context of the real estate profession. Take a listen. Well, maybe it's time for spring cleaning on all levels. And that's not a bad thing. It does mean we have to show some grace because you and I don't know the full story, don't need to know the full story. But what we need to know is why we're serving. You need to know why this matters to you. Do you understand why you see real estate in such a vaunted position? Do you understand why we have our own network on cable TV with HGTV? I mean, real estate's a big deal. But until you, the practicing realtor, take ownership of this, it's not going to get better. Nothing more to say there. All right. Um, so Lee also emphasizes the importance of an agreement that fosters thinking, um, listening, and growth. She, you know, she suggests uh, that effective leadership requires individuals to step up, demonstrate a willingness to grow, actively engage in the designated spaces, you know, to be of assistance. Um, her message encourages individuals uh, to consider taking a supportive role, you know, behind someone else if they're not in a leadership position themselves. You know, highlighting the value of collaboration and support within a team or a community. And we're back to that whole line of disagreement. Disagreement allows us to think and hear and grow. And that's what leadership needs to look like. Leaders need to step up. that are willing to grow, that are willing to move into this space and be helpful. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's not you. But maybe you're going to have to learn how to get behind somebody else and support them. I went to a class one time and Lee had even told the class when I was there, she said, you know, Chris Wright thinks one way. I think another. But we can talk. We can be friends. We can be family. Because we're willing to share our ideas and our thought processes. And those things, are they will change. They will evolve. They'll, they will grow into something that's very unfamiliar to us. So don't be afraid of disagreement. All right. So um, in this next clip, Lee expresses a willingness, you know, to face being canceled for express, expressing unpopular opinions. And she extends this, this, this desire to leadership in general. You know, she emphasizes the importance of leaders and making decisions and the United States of America. You know, she advocates for leaders who are unafraid to voice unpopular views when necessary, not following the status quo, not just going along to, to go along or get along to get along, however they say it, right? Um, but additionally, she then expresses support for term limits. Uh, she believing that, you know, that they encourage more outspokenness amongst leaders who are aware of the, you know, the finite nature of their time in office. I'm willing to be canceled for saying something unpopular. I wish that for our leadership. I wish for them that they will say unpopular things if it's in the best interest of this organization and of the profession of real estate. And if it's in the best interest of the United States of America, I want leaders that are willing to be unpopular. That's one of the reasons I love term limits. I think that if you have term limits, you will have more people that speak up because they know that their clock is a ticking. You love the way she talks, right? North Carolina, always. She has a great accent. I love that. She might not like it very much, but I love it. Um, 
So uh, this last clip, um, Lee uses this metaphorical analogy, you know, to address problems in, in a broader text context. Uh, she reflects on the practice of cleaning out the wound before applying a bandage, you know, as a metaphor for addressing issues in life and in politics and, and society. Um, now, this analogy is extended to discuss the, the, the current state of affairs in Washington, D.C., um, expressing the belief that a, uh, a significant issue lies not only with elected officials, but also with the size of the bureaucratic system. Um, she emphasizes the need to clean out and address the underlying problems within the system before we can even move forward. And some people, again, has referred to this as draining the swamp. Take a listen. And whenever you skint your knee, what did your mama do before she put a Band-Aid on it? She cleaned it out. You got to clean out the problems. You got to open it up and say, I'm going to find all the dirt, get it all out, deal with it. And then we bandage it up and we move on. I just don't think we've gotten all the dirt out of the wound yet. I look at what's happening in D.C. And I know that a bigger problem than our elected officials is the sheer size of this bureaucracy. It's got to get cleaned out. So. There you have it. Those are some of the, I mean, the, the, um, her, th that podcast is 20 minutes long, but I wanted to pull out a few 30 to second to one minute clips. I, I encourage you to go listen to the whole thing. Um, here it is right here. It's crazy shit in real estate episode 438. You can find it on YouTube. You can find her podcast on your favorite podcast platform, be it Apple, Spotify, Google, or whatever. And, but I encourage you to listen to it. Some of our podcasts are 35 minutes plus. This particular podcast was only 19 minutes plus. So it's an easy listen. Go listen to what someone who's actually got her, she's in the arena. If you've ever heard man in the arena, she's in the arena getting bloody and, and fighting for something many of us are not willing to do. So go ahead and take a look at that. I got her picture up here on the YouTube video if you're watching it that way. But um, once again, crazy shit in real estate, Lee Brown, thank you so much for allowing me to use your content for this particular podcast. So, um, you know, wrapping up, um, I just, in summary, I just want to say that we can have a direct impact by voting for our interest, you know, affecting our livelihoods to that, that ensure policies directly are relevant to our job, our income, our family, and our well-being we need to look at the policy alignments and focus on candidates who genuinely support policies that benefit our profession and our economic situation. You know, we need to be adaptable. You know, our personal interests can change just as mine has changed. Yours can change if you're vulnerable and if you're honest enough with yourself. Um, political parties may shift priorities. What are you going to do then? You know, you have to vote for it. I've seen hypocrites that are against something. And then as soon as the party shifts and say, okay, we believe in that now, then the people's thought process shift. When you should have actually been an independent thinker and thought about that on your own. And voting for interest allows adaptation to evolving circumstances. Um, you wanna be an informed voter, be informed about the candidates, stances on issues crucial to your livelihood, for a deliberate voting decision. Have pragmatism over partisanship. And that's where I'm going. Yeah, I prioritize practical solutions over, you know, strict party loyalty for effective governance. And then local impact. Many decisions affecting livelihoods are made locally, not nationally, not federally, but right in your village, right in your town, state or city. So prioritize candidates who understand and address local issues. You could be a Republican in your town and you could be a de Democrat federally or nationally. So don't feel that you always have to vote the party line or stay on that straight and narrow. It's broad, very broad. But at the end of the, end of the day, we have civic responsibility. So we wanna emphasize voting as a civic responsibility, contributing to a more responsive an accountable political system. So that was it for me today. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we should think, how we should vote, how we should look at politics and politicians as this political process is heating up. 
I don't know who I'm voting for still today. I'm still waiting for the candidate that perks my ears up and say, I'm supporting you and your family personally, right family. I'm supporting the industry that you work in. I'm going to make your life more prosper prosperous and profitable. I'm going to take less of your tax money in order to do it. I am going to fix infrastructures that you use, all right, and that you're concerned about. That's what I'm listening for. And I may vote one way locally, and I may vote another way nationally. I hope this helped you in your process going forward because we're only in January and the election's in November, and I want you to be more prepared to vote. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. The Real Estate Happy Hour, please like, subscribe, give it five stars on the podcast because I'm trying. Make sure you watch my reels and clips on all of the uh, social networks. And I look forward to talking to you again next week. You guys have a great day. I'll talk to you later. This is the Real Estate Happy Hour, and I'm your host, Chris Wright. If